Arteta! What a strike! segment of the podcast is a witty joke that's supposed to get you excited to listen and give you a preview of what we're going to talk about. So, uh, um, this is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. I don't really know why we're doing a podcast. There's not a lot to talk about. Um, but we're going to make a podcast out of it. And to that end, I actually have someone at the back half of the podcast. Uh, Taylor Yunani is coming on. He is uh, a Los Angeles Arsenal supporter who's part of uh, Arsenal Los Angeles, one of the official Arsenal America branches. And it was just a chance to talk to him about uh, the upcoming visit that Arsenal is making to the United States, to Los Angeles specifically, uh, what it's like supporting out there with the the challenging time zone, what the supporters group out there is like, the experience this season with the new manager, how they felt about it, uh, if the interest is still as intense as it was uh, years ago, and so on and so forth. So we have a nice little chat about that. And it's also a prelude to the fact that uh, there is an event corresponding to the uh, preseason game with Bayern Munich, <clears throat> because on the 14th of July, Arsblog, you may have heard of him, Andrew, will be out in LA doing an Arscast, which is just like this podcast, only it's called the Arscast, and it's much, much better than this. So, uh, yes, Andrew is going to be out in LA doing the Arscast, and I'm happy to say that I will be out in LA, and assuming that I don't do anything to uh, horrifically humiliate myself between now and then, I'll be involved in that. So there will be a live event. You can uh, find that on all the Arsenal Los Angeles or LA Gooners type um, uh, websites and social media accounts and see details about that. And I'm sure Andrew himself will put out more specific details, but I am delighted to mention it because uh, I am delighted to be involved in it. So I look forward to that. Uh, sitting quietly in the background, however, there was someone who is involved in this very podcast, and his name is Paul, and you can find him on Twitter at Pause in My Pants. Hello, Pause. Woohoo! Woohoo, indeed. So, yeah, we'll <clears throat> we'll chat with Taylor a little bit down the road. You and I can talk about all the nothing that is going on, uh, and yeah, it's all good because uh, I go under the knife tomorrow for some minor surgery. So, if this is the last podcast I ever do, let it be said that it was also the shittest. Um, so, Paul. Um, I guess we'll we'll start with something a little bit light and breezy. Uh, maybe play some games in the back half of this. But the light and breezy thing is Stan Kroenke, uh, not the most popular guy around. Uh, Kroenke out hashtag making its way around Twitter. Uh, some people starting to get a little bit aggravated with him, presumably for all the reasons that we've already known, combined with the fact that our transfer targets are, well, let's just say speculative, um, for mm-hmm. want of a better phrase. I'm curious to get your take on the ramping up of discontentment around Stan Kroenke, what you think is a uh, valid concern, if you think any of it's not valid, and just generally the the increasing agitation about him. Uh, festering agitation. I mean, I don't know of anything new to uh, rub salt in the wound, apart from the fact that Stan Kroenke uh, has a very low-key, distant approach that lets Arsenal largely fend for itself. So my take on Stan Kroenke and Arsenal at the moment in terms of investment, I mean, we don't, there's not many of us who think he will take outside funds and bring it into the, and inject it into the club, even temporarily. Um, but I do wonder if even in terms of the resources within the club, he is uh, kind of once bitten, twice shy in terms of he, he has he has allowed the club to spend significant amount of monies on players over the last three, four, five years, um, and he might must be scratching his head at the moment, trying to work out: is it him? Is it the club? Is it the people he appointed? But he's not getting yes. a return on the investment. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, let me ask and, you this: and, what what are uh, and, yeah? Go ahead. Do, just quickly, kind of. Uh, that was a bit waffly, but I do have a point, which is um, it may be all his fault, but that doesn't change his concern that we're, how does he spend his next hundred million and who does he give it to? And I, th- if I were him and I would kind of fucked up, as he may well have done at this stage in terms of trusting Ivan or whoever along the way over the last few years, uh, he's probably scratching his head saying, do I trust Raul? Do I see a vision? 
do I trust the, the, the team I have in place and how do I transition to here, from here to there? And until I see a team that gives me confidence that I've selected and I'm busy off in L.A. with my L.A. Rams and all this shit, maybe I just leave it for a year or two to sort itself out, uh, sort out its wage bill, get its shit organized in, in the basics, uh, reconstitute itself, and then find somebody I really believe in to allow them to get their hands on the coffers. My concern is he doesn't have the confidence in the own te- the, the team he has himself in place. Yeah, look, I mean, everyone, it seems like Arsenal goes through this every few years. We have a cycle where everyone on social media is suddenly an accountant, uh, an yeah. economics expert, a finance expert, and uh, understands all the laws of financial fair play and short-term cost controls yeah. and all that, or we're forced to be. We might have the most academic um, uh fandom in all of social media but uh we put out an article actually on the arsenal vision podcast website this week from tom jones analyzing arsenal against ffp and i strongly recommend you read it uh and then you can read all the feedback to it as well and create sort of a let's say um canon of financial fair play it's kind of like the game of thrones universe if it was shit um so anyway look there are concerns about Cronky that i think stretch out to two issues one are the financial concerns that he hasn't put money into the club there are some valid criticisms here and some less valid criticisms here two is his failure to be uh, educated enough and interested enough in what arsenal is doing competitively to oversee the 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 way the club is operating i think that is extremely valid i think the fact is all of us probably agree that stan Kroenke wouldn't know uh, a football pitch from a hockey rink. I mean, I don't think he knows anything about football, Premier League football, Champions League football, except, you know, assets on a balance sheet. So I wouldn't expect him to make footballing decisions. But I do think it is fair to expect him, you know, if it, the leader of an organization is not actively involved in that organization you you ha- and doesn't have the skill set or the knowledge to be actively involved, that's troubling and that can cause problems. And we saw those problems with Arsene Wenger probably staying too long, Ivan Gazeta staying too long, and then the people who we've transitioned to potentially not having the joined up thinking that's necessary to lead us forward in the right direction. For you, which is the more critical concern with Kroenke as an owner? The fact that he's sort of a dilettante, that he that he is not a, a knowledgeable, interested, supportive uh, person at, in charge of the organization, or the simple fact that he won't reach into his pocket and fund more of the club out of his own personal finances? Yeah, definitely the former. Uh, the, if I'm him, I want a diversified portfolio so I don't have to get too hung up on any one of my stocks, Arsenal being one of his stocks. Um, and I wish he was just more personally invested in Arsenal as opposed to his other enterprises. I mean, LA is the big one from now with the Rams, ironic given your little spiel earlier about how you're heading off there and the Arsenal LA involvement. But if that goes well for him, he, he's he's set and it will go well for him. Uh, and it takes the pain out of any ups and downs in the other parts of his business. And Arsenal at the moment is a bit more of one of those ups and downs on a down. So he may well be in the stench, the blood flow, um, just kind of keep it ticking along uh, guys, go and sort yourselves out internally before we start splashing the cash again. And I just don't think he has the urgency we have uh, for obvious reasons because it's not his focus. I really think uh, the issue for him is he may well decide to let things stabilize before looking to change the team up. I think Raul is important for relationships for this UEFA Super League. He knows everybody in the business, and that's his strength. Uh, But he's really kind of keeping things ticking along from a footballing aspect. He's not the new face of football and running a football enterprise. And uh, uh, I think it may be difficult in the short term to attract the team that you would want Stan to want given that we've got no budgets, uh, we've got no monies to throw at an incoming team. So I think it's about stability right now or, or trying to achieve some level of stability, getting the finances sorted, getting the wage bill under control, uh, uh, getting aligned internally, and then upgrading the team from an executive standpoint is my fear. 
Yeah, and by the way, you know, I think because we have a fairly educated fan base, like I don't think the vast majority of fans when it comes to the economic side of things, Paul, just want Kroenke to spend some fucking money. Like I think yeah. there's a realization that there's FFP, there's short-term cost controls. Like he can't just go buy us 400 million pounds worth of players on 300,000 pounds per week and turn us into Manchester City or, or you know, the the competitors for the top of the league in Champions League. Like he, he can't do that even if he wanted to. There were times yeah. he could have put money in. I mean, he could have, when he took full control of the club, there are um, there are exemptions that allow an owner, during a change of beneficial ownership, to invest massive amounts of money outside the short-term cost controls or the FFP or whatever it is. I'm, I'm not the expert here. But I know he could have put money in there. He didn't. For example, when John Henry and FSG took over Liverpool, they did that. They paid down a lot of debt, um, creating an environment where Liverpool could then operate self with a self-sustaining model that could be successful and they've just been better run they've made smarter decisions so some money could have been put in i think we have to acknowledge he he did sanction the purchases we wanted to make i mean to my knowledge we haven't gone after players and been told no you can't have them we spent a lot on Aubameyang, a lot on lacazette we did get Torreira, we did get leno we did get i mean Ganduzi. some of these are smaller purchases before that you know alexis sanchez was bought and mesedoza was bought and there have been expensive buys there's also been some nickel and diming, certainly, although that goes on, I think, in a lot of clubs. The economic side of it is annoying because I don't think if there was a little bit of money he could put in to get us a little bit more competitive, I don't think that calculation matters to him. But I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt that he sanctions the things the club tells him it needs to do. I mean, I wish he hadn't sometimes. I wish he hadn't sanctioned yeah. the signing of Mesut Ozil to a 350000 a week contract, right? So some of the stuff yeah. I, I wish... And I think yeah. that may be hurting us now in that, uh, A, it's, it's wonky to our finances, and B, he's like, uh, I'm not doing it again till I feel confident about who's on the receiving end of this money. And, and yeah, that, know. to me, is likely the, ro- the, the roadblock. He's, he's not sure that we have the team in place to spend the next 100, 100 million the way he wants it spent. I have no idea if he's even that granular to care. I know that we're doing a lot of promoting from within, which suggests to me that he's not exactly scouring the larger football world to find the best talent at every position. It is what it is. I think if you had to choose between an owner who would pour millions of dollars in and an owner who is very bright, very cagey, very crafty, very um, uh, knowledgeable about how to run a football club and is very invested personally, mm-hmm. I think you'd want the latter more than the former because the former, I mean, look, you could say, well, no, look at Manchester City. Well, yes, of course, if you're willing to create the artificial environment where you can put money in endlessly, um, although they are potentially facing sanctions, like, yes, of course, that's a good way to win. But barring that... But they're also very, very crafty. I mean, everybody who looks at their operations says not only did they pour in a boatload of money, they're probably one of the best organized football clubs. Yeah, they're incredibly shrewd. Yeah, Yeah. I I, I just think, uh, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't think I hear a lot of Arsenal fans saying we should be the next Petro Club, although some Arsenal fans would be fine with that. But I do think we'd be fine being FSG. And for that to happen, you have to have someone at the top who is competitive, wants to win, is invested you know, emotionally in the success and failure of, of the club. And maybe John Henry isn't, but it sure looks like he is. And he's taken the steps that you take to enhance the competitiveness of the club. And I don't know that Stan Kroenke would do that or would even know how to do that. So that to me is a concern. Do I think Stan Kroenke on balance is a good owner? No. Would I like him out? Yes. Do I think there are things he's blamed for that are not really his fault per se? Yes. I mean, he's clearly sanctioned a lot of buys and a lot of big contracts. Um, but at the end of the day, if you let the bad people keep their jobs and keep running the club into the ground, the buck stops somewhere, right? The buck stops at the absolute top, and he's overseen a lot of these bad choices because he's just not involved in them. Um, you know, I don't think it helps when you don't... And look, I realize not showing up to the final in Baku, like, that's symbolic, right? That didn't actually cause us to lose or cause the club to go down. But it, what it tells you is this is not a person who in any respect has his day ruined by us winning or losing, right? I mean, it's, not, it's just not... It's not on his radar of things he cares about. So on the balance, sure, Kroenke out if you want. I just think we have to really think about w- what we would want from an owner. Do we want a, a you know an, a Petro Club owner? Do we want an FSG John Henry kind of shrewd owner? I think I think I'd prefer the latter, but teach their own. Your mileage may vary. So let's move off of that because it's kind of tedious and frankly like weirdly polarizing. Like I do think that there are some American supporters that just like take offense to this because. 
They're used to sports clubs being called franchises here in America, and they're used to them being run as capitalist enterprises, and like, that's okay, and greed is good, and profit's fine, and like, you know, how dare you criticize this American? They, they take it as an affront, almost as a, as a xenophobic attack, and like, fair play. If that's how you feel, I'm, you know, fine. I think that's crazy. I think that's absolutely crazy, and I, I think it is okay to, to look at this issue and realize that it is not about nationality. It is purely about what's in the best interest of, of our soul. I mean, do you think that's fair, Paul, that there are some people that maybe bristle yes. at this as, a, as an issue of nationality and xenophobia rather than looking at it just as a straightforward what's in the club's best interest kind of topic? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, a reflexive defensiveness uh, to support Cranky by some. I do think it's a it's a smaller proportion uh, of of say American fans, but of course there's the reflexiveness that's anti cranky because he's American, maybe from some on the British side, uh, which is maybe a reflection of of their distrust of foreign ownership. But then you can always point back at FSG. It doesn't have you can have good and bad American owners for clubs, and maybe there's been it feels like there's been more bad than good when you look at. Uh, Gillette and Hicks or whoever it was. Yeah, at, Hicks and Gillette at, were bad. I mean, the Glazers, the funny thing yeah. is the Glazers are always pointed to as terrible because they keep saddling the club with debt, but like, they also won a fuck ton under them. So, I mean, they I did. get that it's not ideal and I don't know United well enough to know, but Jesus, like, I would take the failure that United have had under the Glazers if you get my get my meaning. Yeah, but they, I mean, it, it's a hell of a story, the the Glazers, right? I mean, they, they rode the, the, uh, the financial bubble there, and it could have gone all sorts of ways badly. So it's, it's not really what you do to your club as a fan, but uh, yeah, they looked out in the end. They're obviously pretty smart, but they also took a major fucking risk by with a leveraged buyout and all that shit. That's not how you want to get it done yeah, these that's days. Fair. That's fair, and they but, are they're heavily heavily leveraged still with tons of debt on top of that club. Yeah, yeah, they're now laughing, but they weren't always. I mean, th- there was a while when the debate from the financial sorts were was were they going to make it uh, and how badly would United get raped along the way? And uh, I think United have been basically bankrupt before from from that kind of financial shenanigans. That's that's part of their more uh, kind of medium-term history. So it's not what you want to be doing with your club, but they've come out the other side of it yeah. and they're laughing financially. I guess what's funny, like, what is a good football owner? You, you know what I mean? Like yeah. this, this is a bigger in, question. In some ways, in right? this day and age, with the value of clubs, I mean, the idea that Elton John's going to rock up and buy your club because he's a Watford fan, I mean, it's just not going to happen anymore. It's, uh, unfortunately, it's part of the bigger picture where everything is changing in football. You're not going to have the fan who who loves the club who then goes and buys it unless he's some kind of oil despot who's always been an Arsenal fan. I mean, it's, it's never going to be pretty from here on in. Yeah, I mean, whether you look at Chelsea or City or United, three different types of ownership, all with you know deep challenges and concerns. I mean, I think FSG starts to look like the, the perfect kind of model, right? A lot of experience yeah. owning sports teams that compete at the top level for the biggest prizes because they are run by very bright people who understand how to use their significant resources, but more importantly, understand how to put people in place who just outsmart the rest of the world, right? And I mean... Yeah. That- and we're close with Stan if only he were excellent in how he operates the club. I mean, I, I could well, live with it. I mean, that, and that's where you say, look, except he didn't restructure the stadium debt when he had the chance when he took full beneficial ownership of the club and he doesn't necessarily have the knowledge to understand how to run the the club any better or how to put the right people in place to do that there are oh, yeah. there are a lot of concerns and and so anyway i mean for a topic that probably deserved 5 minutes of stand out and f that guy we've given it 18 minutes of equivocation and i think while i am reluctant to condemn him thoroughly i am certainly willing to say that i don't think that there's anything good about his ownership. I think some of the things that are claimed to be bad are maybe saddling him with with problems that aren't his, but certainly both in terms of his parsimony and his lack of uh, emotional or intellectual investment in the club. I think I think there's big problems there. Now, maybe that's going to be Josh down the road, but I mean, the Josh will save us fantasy seems ridiculous to me. Let's move on. Um, I, I think we could talk transfers. There aren't any. So there you go. Um, but I want to talk outgoings for a minute. I can understand us being slow to 
to get the incoming players moving. I mean, not a lot has happened in the in the Premier League in terms of teams buying. But to some extent, to know what you need to go out and get, you need to know who you're moving on. Are you surprised that there hasn't been more momentum out of the club yet? Uh, am I surprised? No. Would I have liked to have seen it? Yes. Hang on while I ask myself a few questions here. Um, it doesn't seem like much of anybody's been sold by anybody to anybody. We're a Premier League club, so uh, especially with our uh, our uh, propensity for overpaying uh, our average and below average players with high wages, um, we're we're kind of we're n- we're not going to be the guys who sell their players off first out the gates. Um, so I think it would be t- totally surprising if we managed to have somebody move out, uh, unless I'm missing somebody obvious here, just because we're going to have to get the perfect timing of. Uh, you know, if you're looking at like a at somebody like a Mustafi, we're looking for a decent fee, and he's got he'll have probably wages that are beyond what other people are wanting to play pay, and that you know there might be one or two clubs that are a good fit in terms of a league like Spain or Italy. Um, it's not going to be a lot of options where in those leagues you have enough money um, to make that move happen. Uh, we're we're going to be looking. We're only selling them. Well, we might be selling them for two reasons, but one primary reason is we'll need funds to do other things. So I don't think we do. uh, Let me put it back to you. Do we have an easy transfer that should be a kind of a a gimme, somebody of that we want to let go, who's of good value and fits into another league or another team fairly automatically? Nobody kind of leaps to mind for me. I mean, Mustafi ticks some of those boxes, maybe. Yeah, but probably expensive and uh, and not exactly uh, top stack at the moment in terms of w- we've managed to devalue him in terms well, I mean, of visibility. This is abilities. the chicken and the egg problem. See, this is why I just get so frustrated with Arsenal, right? Are you going to buy a center back or two? Are you going to buy a central midfielder? Obviously, you know you need a left back and probably a wide forward, but what about those other two positions? Well, if you don't move on Mustafi and you don't move on Shaka, that impacts the amount of business you can do. And you might say, well, no, it doesn't. We still need two center backs. Yeah, well, guess what? Like, that's not how a wage bill works. That's not how a club works. If Mustafi is staying, God forbid, you can't just put him in the reserves and go replace him with other center backs. You just can't. Um, You know, and the same goes with Shaka. Like, Shaka's an important part of our team. I think he's a deeply flawed player, and I'd be ready to move on from him. But if he's staying, he's going to play 2,500 minutes for you this year. So, you know, I just, without knowing if these players are moving on, I don't know how the club can then go out and target the incomings, um, apart from a let, few obvious positions. Let me positions. help you with that. Yeah. Shaka will be staying, and they'd love to sell Mustafi. <laughs> you, don't think, you don't think Shaka would, will go? Um... I mean, I guess if somebody attractive comes in and makes an offer, but I mean, I don't feel it's on the cards. Do you? I mean, there was like that week where it felt like, ooh, uh, he he's been ambiguous or or less than ambiguous inter. in his statements. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then the, there's Inter and other people sniffing around at least through the media headlines, and then that all died to death. I, it doesn't feel. I mean, who knows? But it doesn't feel like Chaka's a candidate. I I suspect we'll have him next year. Don't you? I'm not convinced. I'm not. No. Because I think if you're going to reshape this team... Oh, I you, agree with that part. You're, yes. We need to raise funds. And Shaka... Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, look, you could get $35, 40000000 million for Shaka. I really believe that. I don't know. We've got anyone else we want to sell that can bring that in. I mean, Lacazette and Aubameyang are the two that have been hotly debated. Um, all right. Well, let, let me put it to you. Let's, let's do a lightning round real quick. I'm going to give you a number and a player, and you say you would sell or you wouldn't, okay? Yep. Lacazette, eighty million. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Uh, and he's really fit. <laughs> yeah, he's very fit. <laughs> he's been on the treadmill. Okay. No, th- yeah. no, Aubameyang's been on the treadmill. Oh yeah. I said Lacazette. Lacazette, eighty. Oh million? yeah. Sorry. Oh Jesus Christ! Hang on. Uh, they're interchangeable for me. Call me a. Not, not for a, me. Lacazette, eighty million. Sell or keep. Lacazette, eighty million. Fuck. Sell. Aubameyang, eighty million. Sell. What if it's to United? Uh. Um, fuck it. With that kind of money, they'll get somebody of his talent somewhere. Okay. And we need we need to rebuild, and you got to play yourself out of a corner. Sorry. Shaka, Shaka thirty five million. If if I memory and I have a co- and I have a plan and I know what I want to do, sell. 
Torreira, forty million. Uh, same applies. Sell. Okay, so you are, and I think I agree with this. I wouldn't sell Torreira for reasons I'll outline in a moment, but I think you and I are on the only same. Only if I have a plan with Torreira. So I, here, I, I, I wouldn't. If you're asking Paul Cassidy if he authorized the sale of Torreira by Arsenal, the answer is no, uh, because I don't believe they know who they want to buy at the moment. I didn't, you know, Sven may, Sven Mislintat may have been something of a myth to us in terms of his magical powers. But if I felt we had a plan, if we had a Sven, if Emery really knew how to spend the money, I'm okay with us reinvesting 40 million. Yeah. I, I guess my attitude is, look, this is a position we basically have failed to address in any competent way since Gilberto Silva. We went out and spent some decent money on a 22 year old Uruguayan who needs time to integrate and here he comes in, and he has a good start to the season. He he sort of fades. He admits he was tired. Like, isn't the reason you buy 22-year-olds to have them for a few seasons and watch their value really skyrocket, not make a tidy little profit, you know, a little mini profit on them in one season, have the same problem? I mean, at the end of the day, this isn't like selling Lacazette or Aubameyang where you have the other one left, which is still bad. It's selling a position we just don't have. We just don't yeah. have a DM. We haven't had a DM in ages. Well, yeah, Torreira might be the one I'm uh, I'm closest to saying no. That's probably wrong. I get. Uh, I, I do think we haven't worked out midfield even with Torreira at the moment. That's why I have a certain openness to us, and I don't think we'd spend that forty million better than than we did uh, by getting Torreira. So. Uh, I'd probably go against that one, but I wouldn't be totally against it if we had a good plan for midfield. You know. Uh... It, it's so difficult too, though, because you do have to factor in the player. And like Torreira's comments make it sound like maybe he's having a little bit of a hard time settling in England. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's reading in a little bit to what he said, but there's some of that. If you're worried that he just isn't going to settle long term and doesn't want to be at Arsenal long term, then you know maybe you start saying, "Well, we're in a selling mode right now because we need to rebuild." So I don't know. How about this? In terms of a player that maybe needs to be integrated, Christian Bielik getting a lot of attention this summer. Mm-hmm. He's played really well, scored the only goal for his country in their last game for Poland. Um, what do you make of what you've seen of Christian Bielik this summer? I mean, he's been playing down a level, and it is important to bear in mind that that is a level far below the standard at Arsenal. But he has impressed at every level. Uh, Cohen Bramo was asked what he thought of certain players in the academy, and he raved about Bielik. How important is it, do you think, for Bielik to somehow be involved in our preseason activities, although he will have played a summer tournament, and be potentially brought back to be in the first team next season? So it's always tough talking about these younger players because we've seen so little of them. So it's kind of, it's more your emo- your emotional reaction to these guys. I've always liked Bielik from the, from the first day he came here. He just seems to have something about him. And... Uh, just his mentality, how he uh, projects himself. So uh, I'm I'm definitely in the pro Bialik account uh, 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 camp. Um, I like everything you can tell of him at the levels he plays. I know the knock against him is he's a little slow, uh, but given the positions he'll be playing in, I think mental quickness is more important than anything. And he doesn't actually look that slow to me. Um, he's good on the ball. Oh, he's very good on the ball. Yeah, yeah, uh, and cocky and confident, and he's always had that big. since. Yeah, he, yeah, big lad can be used obviously as a centre back uh, or as a a, a DM. Uh, if I'm Emery, man, I'd want to have him part of my preseason and see how he looks. Um, uh, and like, just it's been covered before but it's kind of those younger players that bring some excitement to our fairly staid and gray uh short to medium term future here so uh yeah i'll be all over wanting to give bielik more almost more than any other player we we might talk about in the youth camp here uh bielik can, uh, floats my boat yeah, you, you can't you can't prove it, right? But that's that's just my reaction to him. Everything I've ever been able to see on him, I'm like, oh, he, he's actually a good player. He sure he sure seems promising. All right, well let's let's wrap up on this. Um, we have an interesting preseason schedule because not only are we covering a lot of miles, but we are playing some very big clubs. Mm. Um, it uh, Arsblog, I believe, announced that we're going to be playing Barcelona in our final preseason tune-up, the Joan Gamper. 
I believe it's called. Something like that. Trophy. Gim- Gimper, I think it is. No, incorrect. Um, yeah, had a bad leg and uh, it brought his football career to a tragic end. So, yeah, Joan the, the Gimper. The, yeah, I mean, that could actually be a reference to any Arsenal, uh, several Arsenal players as well, unfortunately. Um, uh, you know, Bayern Munich. We're, we're playing big teams. Is the Boreham point. Wood. And, yeah, yeah Boreham Wood, of course, yeah. Uh, but no, all kidding aside, how concerned would you be if we had a really rough preseason against these big clubs in terms of Emery starting the season already? I mean, look, he ended the season not on the strongest footing among the supporters, I would I would say, although still with strong support in many corners. If we go out and have a really bad preseason against these really big clubs and finish our preseason preparation getting hammered in the new camp, how worried are you about Emery's position and standing going into the season before a ball is even kicked uh, for real? Well, uh, I hope we're not that stupid. Otherwise, we need to slap ourselves uh, sensible. But we are. Uh, <laughs> but oh, we yeah. are. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess the question is, at what stage does our stupid- stupidity kick in? I mean, there's no – I mean, preseason uh, – I mean, Tim Stillman's always gone on about that. I, I think he'd build – uh, uh, massive walls so nobody could watch the games because they get all wound up and stupid about stuff. Um, I absolutely bloody love preseason. Uh, it's kind of like stress free. You can dream, you can imagine, all that kind of shit. Uh, but I've no time for reading any results in or reading anything significant into the results. Uh, that's not really your question, though. Um, I, I mean, don't look, it's, think it's Bayern, it'll be that Roma, problematic. Bayern, yeah. Roma, Madrid, and Barca, right? I mean, like, yeah. like you could lose all of those games. Hey, yeah. you could win them all. And, and again, I agree with you; it doesn't matter. But if you get hammered in every single one of those games, for a manager who's coming off a finish to the season that was really concerning, do you worry that he's going to have the legs chopped out from under him before before the season even kicks off? Maybe, but I don't think so. I mean, we still play Angers, Lyon, uh, Fiorentina. Colorado Rapids, Boreham Wood, and in those we'll see some performance. So that that's we get nine overly, losses now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where we get overly excited about playing. I mean, some of those are, are pretty decent teams. But anyway, uh, we'll probably get – whether we win or lose them, we'll probably get some good performances in the in most of those. So it'll balance out. I think it'll be fine. I think we'll find other other areas we can shit our pants over the state of our club. So I think we'll be okay even if we lose to all the big boys. Yeah, I am. I'm always open to shitting my pants. I find it is mm-hmm. uh, just a lot preferable to having to get up and go to the bathroom. So, yeah. all right. Well, I, I actually did shit my pants a week ago after a long run. Are Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> do, do you want to expand on that? <laughs> well, really. I mean, if you go for a long run somewhere and then suddenly your bowels kick in uh, and yeah, you have nowhere to go, you drop your drawers. Uh, well. I was nearly home. I was like within about 10 feet of my bathroom. Oh, Paul. Yes, I know. You need some sphincter control. I will tell you that I was uh, running in the woods once with my dog, and um, the same thing happened to me, and I went in the woods. And the look on my dog's face was so perplexed. He's like, no, that's my toilet. That's where I go. He's like, you don't go there. (laughs) Did he take out a plastic bag and pick it up after you? (laughs) No, no, he didn't. Oh, um, really? No, he didn't. He was very interested in it. I had to drag him away from it. And anyway, this has gone terrible place. This is not an enclosed lingerie promotion. Enclosed lingerie. Say, no, with the no. special add-on pouch. No, no, okay, no. no. We've got. We actually have a promotion coming up. A, a shirt giveaway. It's not going to fit into this episode, but we will get it into the next one. So you don't want to miss that reminder. Uh, our weekly transfer roundup and news roundup on Patreon is still going on. Clive will be back with that next week. Clive currently on holiday in uh, location redacted, so we wish him the best. Tim wrapping up his um, his fine work on the Copa America and Women's World Cup, but when that's done, he will be back as well. So the band is getting back together again slowly but surely, but coming up after the break, we're going to talk to Taylor Yunani about uh, Arsenal in LA, about the preseason tournament, about the upcoming event there, and what it's like supporting out in Los Angeles. So a little something for everybody this pod, a little a little talking about the ownership, talking about the players, talking about bowel movements, and uh, supporting Arsenal from the West Coast of the United States. Stay with us. We'll be back after this. back 
Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce a community representative from Arsenal, Los Angeles, uh, someone who is obviously going to be involved in all the events and build up uh, leading to Arsenal's visit to Los Angeles later this summer as part of the American tour. Uh, we are very excited to have him on. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Taylor Yunani. Hello, Taylor. Hey, Elliot. Thanks for having me on, man. It's good to finally be on here. Yeah, it is a pleasure. We took uh, our time, which is a code for I took my time to set this up, but it is set up. It is happening. And literally, you now are on it and people are listening to it. Uh, technically, they're not listening to it now because we're recording it. But those of you listening to it, you're technically listening to it right now. That's how this works. Right um, now in this moment. In I this exact it. moment. Like, that's <laughs> it's happening literally right now. Um Taylor, you do not have a Twitter handle you're promoting, but Arsenal underscore LA is a place you can find uh, Arsenal Los Angeles. Why don't we start just first with your role as a community representative? I mean, what are some of the things that Arsenal Los Angeles are trying to do to engage the community with Arsenal more closely, to deepen the relationship, to celebrate throughout the season? And then we can talk a little bit more about the upcoming visit. Cool. Yeah. I mean, one of the most important things for us is just engagement, you know, um, Oftentimes we talk a lot about or I'm sure you're familiar with it, but when you know as American fans we're sometimes kind of viewed as potentially um, fair weather or uh, lesser than than some fans uh, from overseas and what we're really trying to instill in our community is um, that we're passionate fans um, that are really the byproduct honestly of all of the deals that have been happening um, back in the UK. So the television deals that have been happening, the money that's been coming into the league um, has really brought football to our front door. And it's more accessible than ever for us here in America. And I mean, we know that even overseas, they don't get all of the games. Um, But here we We pretty much do. Um, The access to them is quite regular. And what we're doing is we're establishing a place um, that's welcoming to all people from all over the world. Um, Any week that you are in Los Angeles, um, particularly we're in the San Fernando Valley, uh, you know that you have a place to watch Arsenal Football Club. Um, And that's what we really want to instill in the community. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that may get lost in translation sometimes is because we can't attend games um, regularly, obviously you can catch a flight, make a you know once in a lifetime or once annual or even once quarterly, whatever it is, uh, pilgrimage to the Emirates. But because you can't attend games regularly and because football is growing but is still not the massive sport here that it is mm-hmm. uh, in Europe and, of course, in, in England and London specifically, what can sometimes happen is that the only place you can commune with other Arsenal fans, so to speak, is on social media or through content. And Truly. so these organizations throughout the United States that uh, bring fans together give you an ability to not recreate the Emirates experience, but recreate a live experience that is a part of what I think Absolutely. makes it feel like a sense of belonging to so many people who are in London and and help s- somewhat export that feeling to people who are uh, in terms of actual distance geographically very far from the club. So uh, where do you guys attend the games? And like what would now look? You're in Los Angeles, and that means mm-hmm. that the kickoff times range from too early to obscenely early. <laughs> I mean, if you're lucky, yeah. you might get an 8 a.m. kickoff. If you're unlucky, unlucky, you might get a 5 a.m. kickoff. I mean, what kind of attendances are you seeing in, in local events, and where are some of the places that you gather? Well, the really cool thing, um, and just to kind of segue from what you had just said into this, um, the really cool thing about what we're doing is that we have a lot of people that attend the games um, that are actually from England, that you know grew up uh, down the street from Highbury, that for one reason or another have relocated to Los Angeles. So they're going to watch the games, whether it's at 4 a.m., which is usually our earliest kickoff, or at noon, let's say. Um, which are, you know, more of the weekday yep. mm-hmm. games. Yeah. Um, so typically um, m- m- my group, Arsenal Los Angeles, we meet at a place called the Fox and Hounds Pub. Um, it's located in Studio City. So it's about a five minute drive from Hollywood. And it's pretty much the heart of the San Fernando Valley for those of you that are familiar. Um, 4 a.m. kickoffs, to be honest with you, Elliot, they really vary um, in attendance. Uh, if we are playing the Spurs... <laughs> Yeah, (laughs) Uh, you know, those games will draw a lot of people, a lot of people. 
even if it's 4 a.m. Because people know how big that game is. And they will wake up. Uh, most people, actually, to be honest with you, Elliot, don't go to sleep the night before if we yeah. have a 4 a.m. kickoff. I remember we'll that lifestyle be, uh, before yeah. marriage and children. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll just be hanging out, having a good time. Sometimes people will host events at their house. And what will end up happening is we'll all have some some drinks and watch uh, highlight reels of the good old days. You know what I mean? A reminisce. Mm-hmm. Um, so those will have massive turnouts. 7 a.m. games, I'd say uh, – are pretty steady at about 45 to 50, 60 people. That's great. Um, it's, it's pretty fantastic. And then, you know, first day of the season, we had, I believe, I counted about 100 people mm. uh, this past year. So turnouts can be pretty massive. However, however. Yeah, however. <laughs> Um, uh, this, this year has been, you know, Europa league has attritional. been a stretch okay. for people. I, I want to stop you because this is something that I did want to get to. So one thing that we do a lot in terms of measuring fan excitement, fan exuberance about a season, about the team, about the direction of the club is we look at the Emirates half full Emirates stadium sends a big message. It's harder to measure that same exuberance and intensity and ex- of excitement from the overseas supporter. I mean, obviously viewing figures can factor into that. Uh, although, you know, illegal streams being what they are and whatnot, it's not as easy to tell. So for you personally, watching the growth of Arsenal LA and then the transition to the Emery era, the the dropping down into the Europa League and some of the performances that have followed, are you seeing firsthand a a deterioration in the exuberance of the support locally? You know, I think that there has been a slight drop off that mirrors what's happening at the Emirates. Um, And it's not for lack of necessarily loving Arsenal. Um, There's no denying that our supporters love Arsenal. But what's happening, um, especially in a place like L.A., where you have to understand there's a lot of people, mostly working class people, um, it's hard to take a day off of work on Thursday um, to go see the Arsenal play a team that you normally wouldn't really bat an eye at. Mm. Um, and so from, you know, for me personally, I'm a, I'm a teacher, a school teacher and graduate student. And so the days that I take off for those Thursday games, they have to be truly, truly, truly meaningful for me, I think, because at this point it's, do I go watch Arsenal take a day off of work or do I go to work because I really need to go to work. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know it, what it's I mean? a big, it's a big sacrifice to make. And I mean, exactly. it's, it's one thing to do it to play Bayern Munich. It's another thing to do it to play carrier bags. So, I mean, do you feel, I mean, well, let's just get to it. I mean, in terms of the conversations you're having in the pub and in terms of, you know, the, the strength of the support, I mean, what's your sort of straw pull on how the Arsenal Los Angeles group felt about Emery's first season and the direction he's taking the club? I think it's, um, you know, I think that as a as a group, Arsenal LA pretty much is along the same lines as, you know, what we're hearing from you and a lot of other people on the pods um, is that he, Emery, he as an Emery, um, it, it's just not connecting for me personally quite yet. And I've, I've spoken to a lot of friends at the pub that feel the same way. There's no doubt that he's a skilled manager, but what we're missing is some sort of finesse in that management that makes me think that he's the guy that's going to get us to where we truly need to be. And I'm kind of of the school of thought where I want to give him one more season. Mm. Um, I really think we needed to win the Europa League. I really do. Mm -hmm. I I mean, it would have been nice, but I just think that not winning it is going to potentially uh, change the trajectory of this club in a lot of really disheartening ways. Um, And we're going to see that happening soon. But uh, I say one more season. I want to see what this transfer window is going to bring up. And I think a lot of my friends agree. Uh, what what can we do? We have a lot of major assets that we need to figure out. Yeah. Well, you I know, mean, that, I also think that we're obviously going to learn a little bit more about the people behind the scenes, too, because guys like Raul and Vinay um, and maybe Edu, if he's if he's getting himself involved mm-hmm earlier we're gonna we're gonna learn a little bit more because we haven't had the window into Raul's process previously uh we're gonna get it now uh, mm-hmm. much more clearly and and to some extent Emery as well depending on how involved he is in the decision making you know one of the things that I think is an interesting question about supporters that aren't in the UK aren't in Europe and especially as far away as Los Angeles is 
you know, how Arsenal sort of became part of, of their lives, how Arsenal uh, ranks in terms of sort of the the hierarchy of, of fan support. There's a lot going on in Los Angeles, not just on the sporting front, but obviously culturally. But, you know, Los Angeles mm-hmm. has a big uh, Major League Soccer influence. Los Angeles obviously has major sports teams in, in all the major U.S. sports. So for a lot of these um, Arsenal LA supporters that you interact with and that are involved in your community, do you find that Arsenal is sort of their first love, their primary club, something they came to sort of laterally from the MLS or from World Cup or something like that? Or, you know, what what is the path to Arsenal and where do you think Arsenal sort of ranks in the hierarchy of, of sports support that you're seeing from the community that you interact with? That's an interesting question. Um, so I think that, you know, at the pub that I frequent, the majority of people that are there watching the Arsenal are there for the Arsenal and that's what they live and breathe in it throughout their daily life. That's how I am. Our Arsenal is my number one uh, sports franchise, mm-hmm. if you will, because yeah, at sure. this point, for me, from LA, it, it's a massive, massive organization. Um, I would say that second place has to be the Dodgers. And, and for Americans, you know, baseball has that sort of cultural uh, spirit here i mean it's very tied in with the fabric of los angeles so when people um, tell so, the arsenal la group to stick to baseball they're they're not far off there you, you know a lot of people like dodgers in la i will tell you that and and you will go to a dodger game i i myself have seen many people in arsenal jerseys at dodger games and have recruited them to come to the awesome. pub mm-hmm. so um but, you know, other than that, I think that, you know, there's a mixed bag of people that support, you know, the Lakers or the Clippers or the Kings. You know, I, I myself uh, am a Kings fan also because I, you know, I grew up playing hockey. It was, a you know, another American sport. And uh, I find that hockey has a lot of parallels to football. And so, you know, the Kings being my team out here, that that's who I kind of gravitated to. However, uh, there's not an Arsenal game I don't miss. Um, and I, that can't be said for the other teams. And I think that would be the same for a lot of people at the pub. Mm-hmm. Uh, with that being said, you know, Stan Kroenke's endeavor in um, Inglewood right now, building the stadium for yeah. the Rams, it's truly a massive endeavor, man. Um, it's larger than life. I mean, driving by it, it's truly something that kind of takes your breath away. I've never seen anything quite like it. So I don't know how that's going to change the the culture of sports out here. I imagine well, quite massively. Let me ask you this. I mean, the fact that Stan brought the Rams back to L.A., that he's building this massive facility that's going to be you know, truly one of a kind out in L.A., would you say that Arsenal L.A. supporters maybe have a more forgiving attitude towards Stan Kroenke because of what else he's doing in the community or do you think that it pretty much mirrors I think what the majority of fans feel which is that he's not out for the best interest of the club you know I don't really I don't know if I can speak to many people's opinions on 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 that question but I'll speak to my own and I'll say that I think think that what he's doing, I mean, really, when you see it, you understand that he's creating a massive amount of jobs for the city of Los Angeles. And that in and of itself is truly incredible. Um, But at the same time, uh, he's a greedy billionaire. Um, I can't imagine he has done everything in the most moral way possible to get to where he is. Um, and he doesn't look out for Arsenal football club. You know, you and I have literally spent more money on Arsenal football club with the, you know, with the exception of him initially buying it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that Arsenal fans true, like fans that will be at the pub at 4am will be at the pub Thursdays for a, you know, a Europa league game. They really are, are of the same mindset as a lot of people overseas, which is, He's he's got to go. Something's got to change, you know, because he's he's not injecting any life into this club. He's really just using it as a uh, a vehicle to wealth or to to maintain his wealth or grow it. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Well, I mean, uh, I, I would I would say that that that's an attitude that most people are are going to uh, be sympathetic to. It, it's really tough, right? Because I think yeah. there are some American Arsenal supporters who who feel that an attack on Stan, the owner, is an attack on American supporters, which is absurd. And and I think totally the people absurd. that take 
that perspective on it, you know, need to have a look at themselves and understand why they have that sort of inferiority complex. But it definitely happens. But I think in general, what you've described is sort of how a lot of people feel about it, which is, you know, that it is an investment portfolio acquisition and, and not about sporting ambition. And he's basically said that himself, that he's, he doesn't buy sports teams to win. So isn't that great? Well, let's let's sort of turn an eye towards the summer. I mean, one of the exciting things about having you on the pod is the chance to look forward to Arsenal visiting the United States. I mean, this is something that didn't happen a lot. Um, you know, I remember oh. when uh, Arsenal made the visit to New York, and that was sort of the start of, I guess, this becoming a more regular thing. And now, of course, with Dan owning the club, it appears that America is squarely on the agenda for summer visits. And there's one happening again this summer in Los Angeles is prominently featured. So first of all, just, you know, I, I think for the, for the most part, I don't really care about preseason. And I've always sort of had this curiosity about the excitement surrounding preseason visits. I mean, for you and for the community, how exciting is it to have Arsenal making the trip to L.A. Uh, for a preseason game? It's massively exciting. Um, and I, I don't think that can be said enough. Um, and one of the main reasons is it's it's a lot of people's first times to ever see the badge in person. I mean, the true badge, you know, um, regardless of where we're at, um, in the league, regardless of our, our position in Europa, you know, I I view this kind of from a teacher's lens. This is going to be a lot of kids first time experiencing Arsenal football club. And, and with that being said, a lot of the people that will be playing in that match are going to be youth players, Mm. you know? So I think it's a really great experience for people of all ages but particularly young individuals who are trying to get more involved in football or in athletics to begin with right um and so we don't get to see arsenal in the flesh very often and so we take this as i mean the whole lead up to this is going to be insane we have events planned um and it's really going to be a thing that unites the footballing community out here. Um, we have four different, uh, I believe four, four different um, Southern California Arsenal branches, um, mm, Arsenal wow. America groups teaming up um, to host a number of events. It's going to be super unique. We're doing things at the beach. Um, and what's really great is it's it's brought a lot of people together that don't normally um, hang out with one another because of distance Uh, Because, you know, L.A. is very, very spread out, Mm -hmm. um, which is the reason why we have so many Southern California branches. Um, But it's really something that's just going to unite all of us uh, for, you know, three, four days. And then we get to finish it off with doing something we all love, watching Arsenal play. Yeah. And uh, without revealing too much, I'm actually going to be out there for an event that'll be taking place. There'll be more information about that down the line. So I'm not going to spoil that yet, but I'm looking forward to making the trip out there. Um, But, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about, obviously, Arsenal aren't visiting every American city. They're visiting a few. And Los Angeles, I think it is fair to say, is the biggest one being, you know, Mm -hmm. basically the biggest city in the United States. Um, Do you get the sense? Have you had people reach out to your groups? Um, get the sense that a lot of people are going to make the trip out to LA from other places around the country to be there for the event? Oh, most definitely. Um, So much so that I believe it was Arsenal America. They set aside or they actually communicated to a hotel near the venue um, where the game will take place to set aside some rooms for people that will be traveling. Um, And so, you know, there is the Denver game Mm -hmm. Um, that will be happening. So a lot of people are taking this as an opportunity to really make this a mini vacation for themselves where they're going to Denver and then they're coming out to LA. Um, So it's going to be... Little little marijuana, little magic mushrooms, and then some beach. Exactly. (laughs) And I mean, and beach and and marijuana too. Okay, yeah, okay. (laughs) It's legal out here also. Yes, just the Um, mushrooms only in Denver. Don't bring that to LA. Just And uh, Oakland apparently recently. You know what? I'm not not up on the drug legalization movement. I apologize. No, 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 me neither. But anyways, um, yeah, there's going to be people from all over. I know people uh, are coming. My brother is a you know frequent uh, visitor of O'Hanlon's in New York, um, mm-hmm. and he will be making the trip out here to join us as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that of many people from um, England that will be joining us, um, some that I do not want to mention on the pod because they'll get mad at us, but it's going to be really exciting. <laughs> I don't think exciting. anyone get mad, but we, we, there's definitely going to be more announcements and, and uh, a lot of people coming out. I think there are so many people, you know, Mm -hmm. coming out, 
that are that just love Arsenal from all over the world, and th- that's the most exciting. I mean, it's almost impossible to not be hyped for this uh, event. It's going to be truly great. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it, and I know a lot of. And other... I get to meet you. Sorry yeah. to cut you off. No, that that is uh, by far the least exciting part of it. But I appreciate you mentioning <laughs> it. Um, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of people that are just really excited for this. And look, ultimately. It is a tension, I think, that you feel sometimes when they they talk about the possibility of the 39th game, right? And and Premier League teams potentially playing regular league games outside of England and what that does to the match-going fan. And as an international fan, the tension you feel is, I wouldn't want to see that happen. I mean, obviously, I have friends like Tim Stillman who never misses a game. And, you know, what does that do to those kinds of fans and what does it say to them? And at the same time, I will fully acknowledge that a preseason game is not something I am interested in. I think it is an amazing chance to get together with other Arsenal supporters and feel a part of that community. And celebrating that community is something that we don't get to do enough together, um, not just here in the U.S., but throughout the world. I think any chance we have to congregate is great. So I look forward to it from that perspective. I definitely think there's a tension of wanting, thinking it would be incredible to have a competitive fixture happen here and also recognizing the extent to which that would be very much at odds with what's in the best interest of the the fans who are local to England and pay for season tickets and follow the club uh, home and away. And and obviously I understand why that wouldn't be something that, that would necessarily be in their best interest and wouldn't reflect an appreciation for their commitment and their sacrifices. So I think for right now, we will just be thankful to have this opportunity in preseason to get yeah. together as a community here, to hopefully have people from around the world come. Certainly, if you're going to have to go somewhere in the United States, you could do a lot worse than the cities they've picked, and Los Angeles is right up there with one that you would want to visit and have a great time at. Um, and you can drive by Stan's new creation and uh, yell expletives at it um, in honor of him. So there's you that. You have to yell for a long time because it's pretty damn big. Well, you know what? <laughs> there's a lot of expletives to sum him up, so get yeah. creative. Look, Taylor, we really appreciate it. If you want to follow him slash the group on Twitter, it's Arsenal underscore LA. Uh, certainly more information to come about the visit out there and events that will be going on. And until that time, uh, Taylor, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on the pod. Tell us a little bit about life out there, other than the fact that the weather is always perfect, but that uh, supporting the Arsenal is, is not too bad out there either. No, it's truly a wonderful thing, and I'm I'm looking forward to uh, you know meeting a lot of people this summer and making some memories that involve Arsenal and you know just the badge. Yeah, absolutely. The well, badge. The, the badge. The badge. The group. Yeah. The experience. It'll be great. Look, I uh, I can't wait, and I know a lot of other people feel the same way. And uh, who knows? There may even be a transfer between now and then, but we won't hold our breath. Uh, all right. Well, my name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter. Yankee Gunner gives five star review. Write nasty things about us in the comments. We will uh, we'll be back with more. We've got uh, Patreon transfer pod number two coming up next week uh, because there will be one every week and hopefully there will be new rumors if there is in fact no actual news. So until then, we will talk to you after Arsenal 10 transfer window network.